unbelievable. Um, so in Ireland, we're quite unique. We're one of the few places in the world where we still do motorsport on closed private roads. Um, so whenever we race motorbikes back home, uh, we do it on the highways and byways. And you can see from this picture of me at Armoy, um, there's not an awful lot of room there. There's a lot of spectators in the background. Uh, this is about 165 miles an hour. Uh, we're jumping about three feet in the air. Um, and the guys that are really fast are much faster than I'm going over this. So if Twitter's taught me one thing over the last year, it's that anaesthetists are fairly boring individuals. They sit in theatre, uh, they give propofol and they put laryngeal masks in and they read the paper. Um, well, I'd invite anybody to come and sit in my office with me at the weekends and we can see how exciting anaesthetists can be. So um, the road racing scene's quite unique. The circuits are maybe seven to nine miles long. Um, the infrastructure isn't great. You can see they're mostly hedge-lined. Um, they're public roads and they're small roads. So they're slightly too, uh, too short for a helicopter to be useful. They're slightly too long to have a series of ambulances and medical cars. So one of our strategies is to use rapid response motorcycles like, like I ride, um, and they cut the circuit down quite quickly. You can be on scene very fast. So this is one of the strangest conflict of interest slides you're ever likely to see. Um, <clears throat> so I'm sponsored by Denesi Leathers, RI Helmets, Daytona Boots, Bridgestone Tires, and Modal Oil. So... <laughs> Uh, if you don't use any of these products, you'll almost certainly die. <laughs> so, uh, so this is our team. It's not just a one-man band. We do have fully stocked medical cars, um, paramedics, other doctors. But the first response in our environment is by fast response bike. So this is me on my fast response bike. This is me talking to Michael Dunlop, who's a multiple TT winner. Um, he's one of the most normal individuals you'd ever find when you're speaking to him one-to-one. -one. Uh, this is Michael Dunlop minutes later. Um, and this sure gives you some impression of the environment that we race in. Um, this is the Southern 100. Um, so even the best helicopter service in the world, there's still a lag of a few minutes before they can get the patients. Sometimes we see patients um, within the first seconds of the dying process, and this is just one such chap. So to orientate yourself, this is looking down the start-finish straight out of the last corner. Um, this chap came powering out of the last corner uh, down the start-finish straight, and we saw him coming. Um, and this was a practice session, so he came out 80 miles an hour, 90, 100, 110, 120, still accelerating. You could hear him kicking up the gearbox in the bike. And as he came onto the start-finish straight, he started looking down the side of the bike, and he started working at something down the side. And he was adjusting a transponder as he was coming down the start-finish. And it was a bit like someone changing a CD in the car, in the motorway. He slowly started drifting, and we, we were sat on the other side of this wall. And we could see it coming, and we thought, oh, surely not. But yes, he rode straight into the end of the pit wall um, at about 130 miles an hour. And you can see from sort of the size of some of the stones that he's ripped out there, this was a massive, massive accident. Um, so we were on scene really within 10 seconds of this guy's impact. And he was dead. He was in traumatic cardiac arrest. Um, we got the race stopped. Um, and like most services, we have a very structured, rapid approach to traumatic cardiac arrest. Um, so there was no CPR. Uh, no clear fluids, no IV access, you get a tube, bilateral thoracostomy.
to the European go-kart champion at the time. <laughs> he got fairly roughed up during this. But Guy had a very impressive crash at the TT races this year. Um, he crashed with a full fuel load. The petrol tanks in these bikes, these super bikes, are full of aviation fuel, so they're maybe carrying 20 litres of the highest octane race fuel you could imagine. And if you look high up in the photo, you can see the petrol tank flying through the air, up there. If you look low in the photo, you can see Guy Martin. There's his leg. So if you look down low, you can see Guy's leg coming out of the fireball. Uh, this was a big crash. This was an, an enormous crash. Uh, there's what's left of the bike. And Guy was fine. He was grand. I um, had a couple of fractured vertebrae, pneumothorax. That's fine for a racer. Let's get away now. <laughs> so this is another example of a bike burning. This is me standing about um, at a road race in the south of Ireland. And we do an awful lot of standing about, waiting for things to happen. Um, there was an incident occurred. The red flags went out. Uh, so we all mobilized and off we went. So the rapid response bikes took off and we headed off to scene. Um, this is what we were met with, a fairly standard pre-hospital scene. You roll up and with motorcycles the first thing you do is count the number of patients, count the number of bikes and see if they match. Because if you have more bikes than you have patients, someone's missing. They're either an, uh, under a hedge or uh, they're somewhere where you don't expect them. So we had one bike, one patient. This is the patient. Um, on first assessment, he was fine, he was talking, um, he, was, he was grand to all intents and purposes. Um, but there was an enormous amount of activity happening in the garden that you can see in the background. There was an awful lot of flapping and shouting and panicking going on. So we did a quick assessment of this guy, he was fine, we split the team, and some of us went up into the garden to see what the hell was happening up in there. What we were met with was we found the bike, um, it had made its way up onto this fence. Um, unfortunately, there was a group of people leaning on this fence watching the races. Um, if you're a fan of motorsport, um, Sometimes, and with bikes, it's odd. If you crash your car, you can pretty much predict what energy has been transmitted. Um, if the car is badly damaged, good chance the patient is. Not the same with bikes. So you have to treat the injuries you find and also what you expect to find. So this is an accident scene. This is the first corner of a race. Uh, we were sat at the back of the grid watching a chap as he pushed the bike out of the, out of the paddock, and he was in a, a state of tremendous anxiety. 
Um, because the race had been called and he wasn't ready. He was still adjusting his brake lever as he got onto the start-finish straight. Never a good sign. So this guy was still working on his brakes as he was about to set off. And you could see eventually he reached a certain stage and the bikes were setting off. And he just went, ah, fuck it, it'll be fine. (laughs) And off he went. So this was the first corner. (laughs) And he arrived at this and pulled the front brake lever and it made a slightly funny noise and nothing else happened. So he crashed. So this is what we were faced with. So we hopped over the fence and found the bike. Very important part of pre-hospital medicine. But Cameron's bike had other ideas and it chased him. And it clipped him in the back of the head and pushed him across the circuit into the straw bales. So he had a fairly significant uh, thoracic spinal fracture simply because of a simple accident, the bike chased him and hit him. 
You can get run over by other people as well. This is me yet again. Um, this is me racing some supermoto in the off season. And I thought I was quite the chap here until a few corners later um, when I fell off and uh, got ran over by my own bike and then by someone else. <laughs> so, uh, this is an interesting slide. Actually, I've had two crashes racing supermoto and this same guy has ridden over me on both occasions. <laughs> So I'm going to go through four mechanisms of concern because I've tried to keep this concise. I don't want to wrap it on too long. So four mechanisms of concern if you're a pre-hospitalist or if you're a receiving physician in the emergency department. Four things that should alert you uh, as areas of concern. He hit the curb. He's got broken feet but is unexpl unexplicably unconscious. There was a boot that's come off or he's had a head-on collision and an apparently isolated femur fracture. So first, hit the curb. If you're sliding along on your back, an 18-inch high curb might as, well, or might as well be a 10-foot high brick wall. So if a rider has hit a curb, one of two things will happen. They'll either stop dead or they'll launch off that curb and go flying through the air. This is someone hitting a curb and stopping dead and then getting ridden over. So this is a compound injury. So although this chap was quite well, the photographer that took these photos rushed up to us and said, you want to see this? Because you can see the amount of rotation he's had on his head when he's hit that and then someone's ridden over him. So we, we were careful with this guy. We packaged him appropriately. The other thing you can do is use it as a launch pad. This is Steve Plater at the Northwest 200. Steve hit the curb and launched himself through the air. So uh, he didn't come to a sta dead stop. He had a big fall from height because he hit the curb. Steve was also fine. He had a few fractures that needed attended to. Uh, but he was grand afterwards, you can see. A couple of fractures, cervical spinal injury, chicken feed for a, for a racer. Helmets. <clears throat> this, is, this is one of my favorite slides because this guy actually has a helmet. It's, it's down there in the front of his bike. But he's too cool for that. <laughs> Helmets have made an enormous difference in reducing injuries. This is a great example of it. Uh, this is a chap called James McCann who crashed at Kells. Now, even if you're not interested in motorcycle sport, you can probably tell he's gone in too fast to this corner, and he's not making it. So he had a crash, and he took out, sorry, he took out this rider called James McCann on his way, but old James didn't know what hit him. Now, James slid along, and he's sliding towards what looks like...
performance for it from them. Now, if you want a good example of a high-functioning team, this is probably as good a slide as any. Uh, this is a sort of three, three or four consultants working on a trauma patient. Uh, the chap at the airway is a GP. The chap doing the thoracostomies is me. That's an anaesthetist. We have a cardiologist putting on pelvic binder and oversight by a general practitioner. So if you've got a good functioning team, any member of it should be able to do most roles. Broken feet, reduced level of consciousness. This is one that caught us out a couple of times in the early days. If someone has slid along at a significant speed and have hit something feet first, it's like a fall from height. So you'll get the occasional typical calcaneal fractures in someone that's unconscious. Um, so if someone has broken feet and are a bit obtunded, think intracerebral hemorrhage or base of skull or high spinal. Okay, helmet removal. Helmet removal is safe. I just wanted to put a couple of slides in here. Um, use two hands, two people. Take the helmet off. We do this about 200 times a year. We've had no second neurological sequelae. We've done about 2,000 over the last 10 years. Taking helmets off is fine. It's safe. Occasionally, you need a plan B, though. Um, we've had a couple of helmets, or I've seen some in hospital practice, where a rider has crashed on the public roads and have lain for a while before they've been found, and they come in with their heads swollen into their helmets, and you can't physically get it off. So our strategy for this, if you've got very little space in there, sometimes the helmet simply won't come off, um, is, sorry, use the old jiggly saw. So if you do have a helmet that's stuck and simply will not come off, you can destabilize it, provide a route for oxygenation and ventilation, and then take it off in a controlled fashion. So if you use a jiggly saw, destabilize it, and just remove the entire front of it, you'll get good access to the airway, and you can then proceed in a controlled fashion. Uh, so, if you're, so you can get right out the face. Now, this is not a plan A. This is a plan B. It's extremely rare for this ever to happen. Um, just take the helmet off would be my advice. Uh, if you're a little bit worried about getting a jiggly saw in by someone's face, cut an ET tube and push that in first, and that will give you a little conduit to put your jiggly saw down through, and then you can take the face plate off. So very rare, but a bit novel. Now, speed humps, these are a curse. Speed humps are a device that are there to allow a rider to be more aerodynamic on the bike, so it allows the airflow over the motorcycle um, to be quite smooth. They have no relationship to safety whatsoever. What they do do is render someone in an unintubatable position if they're flat on their back. So this is a rider lying flat on his back with a speed hump in, and you can see from the position his neck is in, he is unintubatable. His C-spine is not safe, and you will not be able to intubate this man. So it's the opposite of this position, really. So... If you encounter some of the speed hump, take it out. It's very simple to do. Um, if you just run a knife down the outside and cut the leather, the hump comes out. You can also then spin it round and use it as a little pad for the back of the head to elevate them into a neutral position. So we do this as almost the first thing we do when we encounter a rider. Cut the hump out and take it out of the, out of the equation. Right, last case I think this is. Head-on collision, apparently isolated femur. It's virtually impossible on a road bike to hit something head-on and just break a femur because you always rotate around the tank. So the tank will hit the femur, and the femur will open. So if you get an isolated femur, be highly suspicious of a pelvic injury. Always put a binder on these guys if they're in any way sketchy. This is one of my best mates. This is a guy called Herbie Ronan. Again, if you're not...
first picture wasn't captured by the photographer, uh, but if you look there, you can see a boot flying through the air. So if you have a look high up in the slide, there's a boot. So the rider that's just out of shot was coming down to start finish, and the chap on the yellow bike panicked him a little bit. So he put his foot down, and as soon as he did that, his leg went through a couple of hundred degrees of rotation and tore his boot off, broke his leg, and he fell off the bike. Now, there's a couple of things to notice from this sequence of slides. The first thing I want you to keep your eye on is the guy sliding up the road with no boot on. So you can see him there with no boot on. And the other thing is the marshal behind this pole, because this man is like a ninja. He's unbelievable. So this bike is coming at him at probably about 130 miles an hour or so, and it's flying through the air. There it is, about six feet away from him at head height. And again, have a look at the chap sliding up the road with no boot on. So the bike's coming at him again. It's about three feet away from his head now, and he's, cas <laughs> he's casually taking his hands out of his pockets and preparing, to <laughs> and preparing to mosey out of the way in a controlled fashion. So the next slide we see is he's had a wee sit down. <laughs> and the bike has hit the telegraph pole just behind him. And again, you can see our chap sliding up the road here in the foreground. Um, and the back bike bounced off and you can see this marshal just bounces straight back up onto his feet again as if nothing has happened so it was really quite impressive and he put his flag out then at that stage <laughs> so, <clears throat> so you can see our rider um, when we arrived to him he had no, um, no obvious complaints apart from the fact that his leg was sore and you could be fooled into thinking this is an isolated ankle fracture but if the boot has come off there has been devastation has gone on in that leg and we've had a series of these now Limb injuries are quite prevalent in our sport, so you can see this is a significant degloving injury. I like this slide for a couple of reasons, because there's, uh, the first responders on team are a consultant anaesthetist, senior paramedic, um, and another couple of paramedics, and not one of them is looking at the degloved foot. They're going through their structured approach, ABC, CABC, whichever you prefer, um, and they've given, the, they've given the obvious injury a damn good ignoring. And we have a cohort of these guys now that are racing. Um, this is Robert McCrum. If you look very carefully, you'll see Robert has a false leg on. This is Robert's walking leg. This is Robert's racing leg. So he's got two different legs. The walking leg stays back in the paddock, and the racing leg goes on when he goes out on the bike. This is Robert McCrum with his walking leg on, sitting in the paddock. Road racers are tremendous at ignoring risk. This is the first time that Robert was back on the bike after his baloney amputation. And you can see he's quite pleased that he's back out in the motorcycle again. But Robert is tremendous at ignoring risk. If you look closely in this photo, you'll see, first of, first of all, he's sitting on 40 litres of aviation fuel. <laughs> and secondly, he's smoking a roll-up. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty hardcore. So uh, this is Robert, the first time he was back out. He won the senior, champion, the senior uh, classic championship in the roads. And this is him and Dean Cooper, who was the chap you saw on the other slide with his foot degloved, both back racing. So four, me four mechanisms of concern. If you hear these, be aware. Be aware. He hit the curb, uh, or the person has broken feet, but they're suspiciously unconscious. There was a boot lying in the middle of the road, or it was a head-on collision and apparently an isolated femur. And last couple of slides, I just wanted to do a couple, if I'm okay for time. So spectators. Spectators are our biggest pain in the ass. The racers are fine. Spectators are a nightmare, bloody spectators as we call them. Because if you think road racers are good at ignoring risk, spectators are in another league altogether. This is one chap, for example, <laughs> that, uh, that was watching the races at the Northwest 200. And this guy, uh, this slide's quite impressive. This slide's even better when you see where he is. Cause this guy made, because every time we came round in a lap, this guy was swaying slightly more in the tree. Cause, uh, between each race, he would scuttle down like a monkey and bring another six-pack up with him back into <laughs> the top of the trees. So. <laughs> this is another great example of a spectator. Um, this chap we got called to at the Northwest 200. This guy was watching the races, um, had a feed of drink, needed to go for a piss, couldn't find anywhere. Thought that cliff edge looks like the very spot. <laughs> so this chap sort of rambled up to the cliff edge and he was having a pee off the edge of it, as you do, and he got caught, caught by an unexpected gust of wind and <laughs> over he went.
this chap fell off it. So it wasn't something that we had really prepared for. Um, so if you look from left to right, you'll see a hard hat, hard hat, hard hat, woolly hat. <laughs> and if you look from left to right, you'll see safety harness, safety harness, safety harness. And see if you can spot my safety harness in this picture. There it is down there at the bottom of the cliff. Um, so I was about 80 feet up when I realized I didn't have my harness on. And I can tell you I had a kung fu death grip on that statue. So. <laughs> Uh, so this guy got winched up, did very well. Um, we flew him to, again, the most appropriate hospital with appropriate anesthesia, and, and uh, he did very well. And he actually released a press release and said, I'd like to thank all the staff at the Royal Victoria Hospital. He helped me, the intensive care, the surgeons, the nursing staff. So one of our paramedics said afterwards, you know, that's gratitude for you. How does he think he got there? And sat his fucking sleigh. So. <laughs> <clears throat> So, <clears throat> so sometimes your, your input is unappreciated, uh, but that's not why we do it. We do it for this reason. Um, so I think that's me out of time, so I think I'll stop there. So thank you very much. Wow, that was an awesome talk. Thanks you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, to put to this man who's clearly seen it all over here. Um, practice. Um, I mean, we, we do the way that we run this. Usually, we do the first lap of each race, the warm up lap, and the last lap, um, and that allows us a bit of oversight. So we do the first lap, last lap, and warm up lap for a few reasons. So if an incident's going to happen, it'll usually be on one of those three. Uh, when you have a pack heading out together on cold tires, full fuel loads, and it means that we have oversight as well. So if something has happened on the last lap of a race and has been lost in radio traffic, we can still pick it up. And it allows us to keep a little bit of temperature in the tires. So just enough to go. from a vehicle, you have to look at the person's leathers and decide where are the seams, where are the stretch panels, where's the reinforced areas, how am I going to cut this so that it doesn't turn into a butchery session. And ideally you want the leathers to come off and look a bit like a bearskin rug afterwards, so there's only a couple of cuts and then the whole thing folds away. But you do, it does take a bit of forward planning to come up with a strategy for each different set of leathers, each manufacturer will be slightly different. Yeah, quad bikes I think pound per pound are the most dangerous vehicle in the entire world, so... <laughs> That's why I only have two of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, the quad bikes are, are a funny beast because it's quite difficult to be ejected from a quad bike without it rolling over you. 
And that's the classic quad bike injury is a rollover injury um, where someone's flipped it and the bike has, has pirouetted over the top of them. Uh, so they seem to be tremendously unforgiving. So I would say um, be aware that these patients can have contiguous injuries in different body systems. Um, and that seems to be the, our findings from quad bikes is that you, you rarely have an isolated injury because the only way really to break your tib and fib with a quad bike is for it to have rolled over the whole body. So be aware, and like any trauma patient, you know, expect the unexpected with them. Now, a few of us have carried like a pre-hospital kit, which you're obviously yeah. carrying there, and it's phenomenally heavy. It's pretty awkward. And you're racing the motorbike. Yeah, there's... There's a lot of work has gone into this kit. Um, we've gone through a few, through a few phases. We tried Thomas packs, um, which was impossible. You know, after three weeks or three days at the Northwest 200, you just you can't carry them anymore. So this system is an Emergo system. It's Swedish, um, and it's four pouches that sit at waist level. So when you're sat on the bike, there's very little load on you, and it keeps the center of gravity in the middle, so it doesn't really affect riding. Um, and the backpack, we try and keep the weight as low as possible in it. Uh, so we still carry about 20, 25 kilos worth of kit, but it's spread quite nice and evenly. Um, and uh, there's a lot of work goes in to try and keep ourselves reasonably fit for the start of the racing season because this is hard work. This is really hard work. Um, and it's difficult jumping out of a helicopter to treat someone. It's even more difficult if you have to ride nine miles flat out on cold tires, um, upwards of 180 miles an hour at times, and then jump off and then run into a field and then treat the patient. So there's, uh, we have to, the equipment has to be right and yourself has to be right. And pre-hospital medicine is probably one of the only fields in medicine where your health can actually have an, in, an impact on the patient's outcome. So we think very carefully about how we package the kit and uh, we keep ourselves in reasonable nick so that we can do the job. You mean 180 miles? Yeah. <laughs> we control it tightly. I mean, the systems that we run are very, very robust. Um, there's radio communication from every flag point around the circuit and in between. Uh, so the, we usually set off before the race has nearly come to a stop. So if an incident happens, it's stopped by way of red flags. So the flags come out, everyone slows their racing speed down, uh, and we go live. So by the time that we reach an accident, the track is still live but controlled. Um, and then whenever we reach the accident, the bikes will start to filter back to the grid. And then the track is it's still not open, um, but that's when you'll find that, for example, spectators start wandering out. Um, so part of our strategy is to go quickly um, as soon as an incident is declared and then the circuit can be gradually brought down to a stop um, and bringing something like the Northwest 200 to a stop is very difficult you can have 50 bikes over 9 miles all doing 3 figure speeds um, so it, has to be, it can't just be stopped it has to be sort of brought down gradually over a minute Our allegedly regional trauma centre. Um, so we very often do most of our transfers by land, um, which is why the, the interventions done on scene and on route are so important. Um, so we do aim like any service to try and deliver them as optimised as we possibly can. Generally, if it's a big enough incident, all the medical staff will, will attend to it. Um, if a race is stopped, um, everyone just comes. And generally, they arrive in dribs and drabs as they can. Um, so there, everyone's usually involved in some way, um, either infrastructure or taking care of the track, uh, you know, clearing an exit route for the ambulance. Um, so everyone's usually fairly briefed as to what's happening, and then the most appropriate person goes.